Welcome back in the Feed Your Brain podcast. Um, my name is Max, and we have another tech thought leader in the podcast after we already had Ryan Carson uh, last week, which is the co-founder of Treehouse, uh, also very known in the tech scene. Uh, today, we have another special guest um, with uh, Tristan Lewis, uh, digital thought leader since uh, decades, I would suppose. Um, very known in the tech and digital industry across the globe, uh, has been in has been featured in many different television shows and also, of course, in the media industry in general. Um, currently, he's uh, the president and CEO of Casebook, which uh, we will definitely touch a little bit later. But uh, I think there are very, very uh, like there are quite a lot of interesting uh, stations that he has gone through before that. Also, a German company because he has been um, the global head of internet and and uh, digital and in, and at uh, at Deutsche Bank, which of course every German knows. And um, you have been the chief innovation officer at HSBC, HSBC also quite. Famous bank, one of the most famous banks in the world, I think, for six years. Uh, you have been the co-founder in of to in total six companies with two IPOs, so also very interesting here and three exits. So this actually quite uh, sounds um, very impressive and very interesting. And maybe to give a little feedback here for the listeners, um, I used to uh, do a couple of keynotes about podcasting, and uh, I was interested about the industry in general and how it evolved. And uh, that's how I came across Tristan because he was one of the first inventors of the RSS feed, which now actually leads every podcast, also mine. And I think it's also very interesting to cover that. So welcome in the podcast, Tristan. Good to have you here. Thank you. And uh, I don't know if I can live up to uh, to the great listing that you created there. <laughs> it's, uh, it's somehow your fault. You have done all the different stations. So uh, I try to summarize a little. <laughs> I've been lucky to be in the right place at the right time. It's. Um, it's actually kind of interesting because I've been uh, in this field since uh, 91, 92, really starting with my first company in 93 and then kind of took a life on its own and that just happened to go along for the ride. I can totally see that. I mean, it seems that you're very humble about it. I mean, starting from 91, how was how was, I mean, you have, you've lived technology and you've lived internet before the dot com bubble and bef yeah. before all the technology actually happened, how how was the scene back then for a person like me who wasn't even born, and maybe also for the industry, uh, for the listeners who are also interested in the industry, technology, and internet? It's the secret to being lazy, really. At the end of the day, <laughs> I, um, um, so uh, I'm French um, by birth, and uh, I was lucky enough that uh, there was this thing that happened in France in the 1970s and 1980s called the Minitel. And uh, the Minitel, for you listeners that may not know about it, was this terminal. The French government um, had a telco monopoly, um, and uh, they had, at the time, they only had land phone lines in, uh, in every household. And someone at the, uh, the National Telco did the calculations and realized that it would be cheaper for them to put a computer terminal in every house in France uh, mm -hmm. instead of shipping the phone book to every house. And so in the mid-1970s, the French government went and just dropped those computer terminals in everyone's house in France. <laughs> so, uh, if you're a kid in France that's grown up in the 70s or 80s, you started going online and doing online chat, online gaming, etc. So uh, yeah, that kind of sets you up as a, uh, a digital beginner, really, at a time when no one else anywhere around the world is connected to any social network. <laughs> and uh, and my parents moved to the United States in um, 1985, so I had to follow along. I was only 14 at the time, and the U.S. was actually behind. <laughs> <laughs> when would well, that sounds weird? <laughs> yeah, the U.S. did not have kind of this mainstream idea of a digital world, but they had uh, computer BBSs, um, and it, it was stuff that was only run by computer geeks, really. But I started uh, falling in love with that crowd and uh, because I wanted to reconnect back to my friends back home and, right. uh, um, and find my way that way. And uh, somebody in 1988 or 89 mentioned to me, you know, there's this thing called the internet there. Uh, it connects everyone around the world. And so 
I uh, kind of hacked my way into a university system. Um, <laughs> and at the time, it was all like text driven. It was like, if you open up your terminal on the Mac, this is what the internet looked like. <laughs> so I get into that computer system, and I had no clue as to what to do. So I end up going to an American university. And the first thing that I do is I go and sign up for access to the internet, because I know that it's, it's going to be something that, uh, that is going to matter. And oh, then so I, you needed to, to actually sign up for the internet? You had to sign up. Yeah, you had to actually go into like a dark office in a basement somewhere. And the guy <laughs> was like, oh, the internet? Oh, yeah, let me look at the forms. And he would pull up like a paper form, <laughs> and sign up for an email address. And like three days later, they would uh, call you on your landline to tell you that you had an email address. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you could go to like this lab that was in another basement, and you could like connect to the internet there with your email address. And so, but in this small lab, was like a small group of people that were interested, and this is like 1990, 1991 now, uh, that were interested in the internet and created like this yeah, I created this friendship with the people there. And one of the people there was um, a fellow by the name of Paul Jones, who was a teacher at the university. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a journalism student, and I was chatting with Paul about you know, setting up uh, a magazine online, the idea that I would set like an online magazine, use the internet to like, distribute things all over the world. Um, and he was like, oh, that's kind of an interesting idea. Why don't you come? I'm having this party with uh, this, uh, this guy that's coming from uh, Switzerland. He's got this new thing that he's calling the World Wide Web. And <laughs> show us what, it's, uh, what it runs like. And so Tim Berners-Lee uh, shows up. And um, he's got a Next station. Next was like this big black cube box. And um, he connects it up to the phone, and it's like a big clunky modem, and then uh, and opens up the web browser. And how was the web browser called back then? Web browser. Oh, it was called web. web, web. <laughs> it was called web. <laughs> and uh, and he shows us how documents are links, and it's just like hyperlinks, basically, no images, right? Just text but hyperlink documents. Mm -hmm. um, and then he shows us that there's under view, there's this thing called view source, which allows you to see all the code that is powering that web page. Mm -hmm. And he goes, and then putting it in every browser or anything out there, anyone can copy the code and learn from that. And so he you know, does this demo, et cetera, and it's like my brain goes, wow. <laughs> this is this is simple because I can copy the stuff that somebody else has done, and then I can kind of modify it, and then I can put it on the internet, and now it works. And so, uh, and he's um, he goes, okay, so here's two computer disks, <laughs> literally floppy disks. Uh, it's got all the source code for the web browser, the web server, and the HTML pages that he's created. And so we, you know, he leaves, and uh, we end up with some friends finding a next station on the college campus. We kind of commandeer it. So <laughs> we load up the web server on there, and we put up his pages on the web server, and we start screwing around with it. But we didn't know at the time that there weren't really that many web servers. Mm -hmm. um, when we put up ours, it was the 23rd one. Wow, the 23rd? 23rd, yeah. Some people say maybe the 24th. Globally. <laughs> In the top 25. <laughs> uh, and because, the, because there weren't that many web servers and not that many web pages on each of the servers, you literally could go around the whole web. You could see every single page on the web in under two hours. Wow, that's insane. Yeah, so um, got kind of hooked into. And how, did, how did you find other pages? Was it like because of the hyperlinks, or how was that caused? So Tim actually on his site at CERN had like a listing of all the sites, and so you would email him if you put up a site, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he would change the code, and he would uh, just um, add your site on there. 
And, you know, that was now on the list. Insane. The reason I'm telling this story, though, is that because it wasn't just that we put it up, but several years later, um, about 2000, 2001, the CERN website uh, was taken down, the original website. And uh, along with it, where uh, Tim Berners-Lee's web pages were taken down. And at the time, uh, actually since then, there hasn't been any copies of the original web pages on the internet uh, at the original CERN site. And they had lost the computer disks that Tim used to distribute. Oh, wow. But um, Paul Jones at UNC was smart enough to actually put all the stuff online. Mm -hmm. And so UNC Chapel Hill, uh, Sunside at UNC, uh, now Metal Lab, uh, became the host of the first web page on the internet. <laughs> how, is that, how fun is that? I didn't even know that, that you were in, around that story there. Yeah, and so it was like, yeah, it was this early, early days. So then, you know, I graduated from college. I tried to, to be a, a journalist. And uh, uh, when I came to New York, I started connecting with people in the internet uh, field here mm -hmm. and um, uh, got connected with some friends of mine that wanted to uh, launch a magazine about the internet called The mm -hmm. Internet World. And um, through uh, discussion groups, because there were online discussion groups uh, through something called Usenet back then, mm -hmm. uh, got connected to some journalists and uh, came up with this idea that we would have a new site about the internet industry um, that would publish news every day uh, about the internet. And <laughs> I mean, I, I know that it's like, well, it doesn't every news site does do that now. Well, right. in those days, we were the site. We, you went to internet.com and we were the only site that did that. Um, how was it called? Was it internet.com? That was that's how it's called. It was initially actually it was initially called iWorld, I W R L D, and um, then later uh, we acquired the domain name internet.com for an outrageous amount of money. Uh, I just wanted to say that. How like do you can you say it or is it still a secret? It was less than six figures. Less than six figures. Okay, yeah. but today you would probably pay uh, billions for it, right? I don't know how much you would pay for it, but yeah, it would probably be fairly expensive. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've seen other domain names go for millions of dollars, so I think right. it would be fairly expensive. And so we, uh, we launched the site and we became kind of the go-to destination for uh, stuff on the internet. Uh, and we had a trade show uh, called Internet World, which became like the big trade show in the industry. Mm -hmm. And in um, in 97, uh, a company approached us about buying the print magazine and the mm -hmm. trade show, but they had no interest in buying the website. <laughs> so we kept the website and we took it public. And uh, it, it, we took it public for uh, as much money as they had acquired the trade show and uh, the print publication for. And that continued, you know, throughout the, the whole dot-com era. It was kind of this big, crazy time when uh, everyone in the industry was kind of figuring things out. Mm -hmm. And you would have, you know, you, people would come to our trade show and we would have like big dinner parties, et cetera. And people would show you like, hey, I did this new thing, you know. So like um, Mark Andreessen, for example, from uh, Andreessen oh. Horowitz. Horowitz, yeah online and uh, go, you know, I invented this thing called the image tag. Uh, and then like, that would be like this big scream. Oh, no, that's a terrible idea of putting images in text. <laughs> um, but then people were like, oh, you know, that could be cool, actually plugging this stuff in. And you would have those fierce debate. And then somebody else would go, oh, I invented this thing called the blink tag. And then some people would go, well, that's a great idea. Another, and, <laughs> and bit by bit, through those discussions, um, Tim realized that it was getting kind of messy, so he created the World Wide Web uh, Consortium, mm -hmm. which was responsible for what was okay in terms of putting into HTML and what wasn't. And so through that, um, so it was more like a regulation kind of kind of thing, or like a, a body that defined that helped define what the standard 
for HTML. Oh, well, I understand. Okay. And eventually, the standard for CSS and for uh, JavaScript. And so you now have like a way that uh, every browser can uh, render this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so uh, doing other startups along the way, I ended up in um, 2000 doing some work for a uh, big telephone company, uh, like a company that was making mobile phones. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was already starting that. Was it like a famous company, or was it more like unknown now? No, it was a very famous company. Um, okay. I can't really mention their name. Mm -hmm. uh, but they had something that was new. Uh, and the new thing that they had was that they had a phone that could take pictures. <laughs> um, a camera phone. Uh, I know every phone now has a camera. But um, the thing that they also had was that they had set-top TV boxes. Mm -hmm. Uh, boxes that was con were connected to the TVs. And one of the things that I was uh, helping them was was trying to figure out how to take those pictures from the phone and send it to the TV. And at the time, the Netscape had come up with this concept of RSS, uh -huh. distributing news. And there was a fellow by the name of Dave Weiner, uh, who was also involved very early on in helping RSS grow. And uh, Dave was kind of managing the standard around RSS. And so I, uh, I asked Dave you know, uh, about an idea that I had, which was to attach files, attach images, and attach audio, and attach movies to an RSS feed mm -hmm. so that you would have a tool on that set-top box that could pick up the stuff. And so from my phone, I could literally send the stuff to a TV. And that was the main reason for my getting involved in the podcasting space was because right. I wanted some kind of attachment for RSS that you could subscribe to. And that's I think that's incredible. I mean, if you if you look at how many podcasts are out there now and how many people actually earn money by just having a podcast, which I don't, but of course there are a lot of people that actually make money with the podcast and actually build a personal brand or a company brand with it. I think it's insane if you look at the last now 18 years from where you have started the road of R how actually thinking about RSS. I think I was one of the people looking at this. I think uh, Dave was another person that was looking at this. And I think Dave deserves a lot of the credit for actually taking those kind of crazy ideas that were coming from people like me um, and uh, wrangling them into a standard in RSS around uh, enclosures that right. podcast what they are today. Interesting. And but did you already know that it could that it could be something that might also be um, yeah might might cover a podcast or did you already think about audio or was it something that was not on your mind yet? Yeah, so, so in my view, at the time the challenge was that you know internet connectivity was still relatively slow. We didn't have the kind of bandwidth that we have today, mm -hmm. and so the idea of podcasting was that we could deliver fill that gap really in terms of downloading stuff. Mm -hmm. So the idea was that we could attach not only pictures, but we could attach audio, we could attach movies, and distribute that. So you would subscribe to a bunch of feeds. And at night, when you were sleeping, et cetera, it would take the bandwidth that you had and download all that stuff. And then it would be available to you when, uh, when you wanted to consume it. Got it. Interesting. I mean, uh, I mean, podcasting has also been something that, like, I think around like two thousand six, two thousand eight, uh, it has already been big, and then it went down again, and now it's becoming big. So, I think it has always been there, and people are really aware of it now. And I think especially the young generation uses podcasting as a passive tool to to consume content. And I think. Uh, you have been part of the road. I mean, you have been part of the entry of the RSS feed, and you gave us the chance with Dave together to uh, actually manifest a uh, yeah a content possibility around podcasting, which which I find amazing. So actually, thank you for for contributing uh, for contributing. I mean, it's it's great. Um, maybe to to give a little insight here. I mean, you you mentioned a couple of names with uh, Mark Andres, and how was. How was the tech scene back then? Which are there still names? I mean, Mark Andresen, uh, Andresen Horowitz is quite famous for its VC funding, so they are quite well known. Are there any like other tech 
giants that have already been in the scene back then and they are still relevant to today? Yeah. Is there some people that you are still in touch with? All the, most of the big people that you hear about today were around at that time. So Jeff Bezos was trying to figure out how to build a bookstore, right? An online bookstore. Why was he doing books? Because he had figured out that uh, uh, there were already like organized stuff in terms of distributing books. And so he could just put a, front, a web front end to that mm -hmm. and run a bookstore called Amazon, which eventually became kind of the ever same store, right? Um, right. Uh, and uh, I think, at that, of that generation, those are really the big names. I mean, Steve Jobs actually was also around. Um, Steve was focused, Steve was actually the founder of Next, which built those big black boxes. Um, so you were in touch with him back then, or? I, uh, I only met Steve once back then, uh, and, and he had built a, a piece of software called Web Objects, which was for, uh, building software applications that were web connected on uh, the next station and it was buggy as hell and <laughs> uh, and uh, i told steve that this product is crap <laughs> 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 um, and uh, that you know that's not a great way to start a relationship <laughs> but, uh, but steve really worked on convincing me that uh, of the greater vision that he had around this product, and that was you know amazing. We did. I can't say that we were close, um, but we got to talk a few times between then and um, unfortunately his passing. Uh, great. I mean, uh, interesting to talk to someone who has actually been very close with those tech giants, and uh, of course, my generation now observe different different tech giants that are maybe relevant today. But I think looking at how those tech people and tech oriented people like you and Steve and of course uh, Mark and Drazen who have somehow actually gave us the chance as a new generation to make the things possible that we have now I think that's super interesting but generally you talked about Bezos you talked about jobs you talked about of course your your own experience do did how did those people back then and how did you especially think about technology in the in the early 2000s did you already know what's going to happen did you already know that technology is now internet of things and you can connect different things. Did you already imagine stuff like that or how was your approach back then? So I don't know if we knew anything. I think that we kind of had ideas as to where it could go. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of those ideas were based on some of the things that we were seeing already and some of them were based on things that we couldn't do. Um, but we had some uh, rough ideas as to what it could potentially get to long time for a lot of the things that we were envisioning to actually happen. Some mm -hmm. of them had not even happened yet. But uh, uh, I think what happens is that you technology is this great thing where you imagine a world and because it's code, you actually can make that world happen. Right. You can actually sit down at your computer and start thinking through how you actually make those types of things happen. There's really no real barrier to entry uh, outside of you know getting access to a computer and a pretty decent um, uh, IDE to be able to write your own software. Right, and uh, it has evolved since then, right? I mean, now we already have uh, automatic systems that help us uh, getting the code more structured and more organized so that we can actually build products from the start without any coding skills, which of course is going to still be relevant, but it, it, there are definitely features that help us to, to, to build products without maybe actual software or and interest. The, I think the world of, uh, of APIs now is also allowing you to get a functionality that you don't have to build yourself anymore. Because right. you no longer have to worry about latency, which is you know the speed at which stuff is moving from one end to, it, to the other on the network. Mm -hmm. and, and so that allows you to really build apps that are sitting directly on the internet and connecting to other APIs that people have built that are very specific for one particular type of use. Right, right. I mean, I'm a big fan of APIs, especially in regards to technology products. It's just uh, amazing how many features and how many uh, technology software products you can actually dock into your own product. And I think that's that's great. Um, maybe to go a little further now, I think that's also very interesting. Before you um, you went to HSBC, which uh, I'm sure was very interesting, and we will definitely touch on that a little bit more. 
um, you actually covered a couple of IPOs and you were also um, just in the scene back then, in the technology scene, and you actually brought them to the public market. How was, like, from maybe you can also mention like a couple of success stories, but also failures that maybe you learned from that time, bringing stuff into the public market, F giving something back or giving something to the younger generation or maybe to people that are also interested in building technology products. Why did you actually went for IPOs? Or why did you want to reach the public market with the internet products and which failures did, did, you, did happen along the way? We, so I think that the 90s.com bubble was a very different time than uh, the times we're living in now. So yeah. I don't know how much it is currently applicable to um, the, the way things are going these days. But uh, back during that time, uh, you once, Netscape went public, which was in 1995. And Netscape was the company that uh, Mark Andreessen co-founded, which mm -hmm. was at the time the leading web browser on the market. And so really the entrance to a lot of the web and uh, therefore uh, for a lot of people, a lot of the internet experience. Mm -hmm. uh, once that happened and millions of people became millionaires as a result of or thousands of people became millionaires as a result of it. Mm -hmm. There was this rush of money uh, for anything that had the word internet associated with it. <laughs> and so uh, you could raise money from a VC, but you literally went through like the VC to IPO cycle very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. like, you, could, you could take a company public in three to four years. Oh, wow. and, and so that was a very different climate than uh, what we're dealing with today, where you know, it takes more like eight to 10 years and getting to like 500 million or a billion dollars in revenue. Whereas mm -hmm. back then you could take a company public on a business plan and some prospects and a little bit of, um, <laughs> of traction. I mean, in a lot of ways, what companies today are doing in terms of getting to series B mm -hmm. is the stage where people were going public got it Except sounds a little bit like the blockchain bitcoin industry now where just everybody throws money at everything right yep and that you know that happens i think with every new technology cycle um when it when it happens it's both a good and a bad thing it's good in the sense that it releases a lot of cash for innovation and a lot of money for innovation so people that are serious about building innovative uh, technologies and building new business models on those innovative technologies can actually get the type of funding that they need in order to get there. Mm. It's a challenge because then um, there's also a lot of dumb money floating around and a lot of dumb ideas that uh, end up getting funded. And so mm. what happens is that you see like massive amounts of money being invested in a particular area. And then something happens uh, generally, and it's like a one company that managed to raise a lot of money on something that was not necessarily fully baked uh, ends up failing. Mm -hmm. And as a result, there's this sudden drop in the amount of available capital for uh, new ideas, which then makes it difficult for the people that are actually trying to do stuff. It eventually comes back, um, but it's a cycle that I've seen happen uh, during the dot-com era. I mean, we had not only the dot-com bubble, but then the dot-com crash in 2000. Mm -hmm. Nearly killed uh, the internet industry. I mean, people mm -hmm. don't realize, but some of those companies that we talk about today almost died. Like Amazon almost had to close its stores. Really? If you think about it, and that's kind of great. You're looking at it from a today's angle. That's kind of crazy. I mean, Google, was also at the point where they were having very hard financial times uh, back in those days. But then um, the people that believed in the technology kept on plugging away, et cetera, during those years that were probably between 2001 when the dot-com crash happened and about 2006 when the bubble, the new bubble, the web 2.0 bubble started inflating again. Mm -hmm. and during that time, you had a massive amount of innovation that happened without necessarily getting the funding. Mm. Uh, and some of the innovation that happened during that time 
started really coming to fruition. And so you started seeing the basis for uh, some of the bigger companies in social media, for example, Facebook, for example, LinkedIn, mm. uh, that popped up during those days and built a business model at a time when there wasn't necessarily a lot of money to fund them. Uh, and then in 2008, with the introduction of the iPhone, everything kind of changed again with the mm. ability to have access to mobile uh, kinds of technologies, build mobile apps in 2009, and at that point, creating a new cycle, which led to a lot of funding in mobile, a lot of mobile companies then failing, leading to a drop in the funding for mobile, mm. and on and on and on. I mean, now it's ICOs, and uh, it was Internet of Things a year ago or so. Right. so you know, it will be the next thing after that. Right. And uh, I mean, if you if you look at how exponential actually everything happened, I mean, we're talking about 10 years now, starting from the iPhone until 2018. And I think 10 years for somebody that's interested in the tech scene, is, it doesn't feel quite long. I mean, you have went to different stations and then part of your part of your road was to go to a famous bank after I think as far as I understood, you sold the consultancy to uh, consultancy to H uh, to HBSS, and then you went into HBSS uh, HSBC. How how did how did that came into your mind to actually go to a bank? Which of course, from now, if you look at if you have a look at time now, it sounds a little bit uh, maybe old. And <laughs> what was your point back then? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it was you know there are ups and downs in every business, um, and uh, with the dot com crash in um, 2001, what happened mm -hmm. is that if you, much like there was a lot of excitement in terms of getting, giving money to everyone that had the name internet attached to, uh, to them in 95, 90 through 2000, by 2001, if you had the name attached to you or technology attached to you, <laughs> then people were running away from you. You were literally, you know, diseased as far as they were concerned. And, and as a, um, as a startup, as a company that was trying to negotiate through that kind of stuff, you had to figure out a way to um, to navigate through those types of waters without getting any type of investment. Mm. And so uh, for anyone that's listening to this podcast that's trying to build something, you're going to hit a point uh, where you've built something and you're relatively successful in terms of market traction and you're going to want to raise money and there's going to be that point where you're not necessarily that successful at raising the money because trends other than uh, uh, than what you you're building, and because the money may be going somewhere else, or because people have concerns about the way the uh, financial markets are going, or so some reason or another. And my advice to your listeners would be continue plugging away because somehow. If you are doing the right thing, if you are pushing through, the money problems solve themselves. Mm. Eventually get through, if you're building a good product that people care about, you eventually get to the point where somebody will help you um, take it to the next level. Right. And in the, case of, um, in the case of what happened when, uh, when it came to HSBC, the, the situation there was that my... I was not running, I was running a company that was successful, but I wasn't running a company that was going to be a multi-billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. And HSBC at the time was one of our biggest customers. Um, and they For wanted, your consultancy, right? Yeah, of the consultancy. And they wanted to do more business with us. But having survived some of the slings and arrows of the dot-com crash, I was worried about them representing more than 20% of our billings. Mm. And so I turned down work from them because I didn't want to create extra risk for us. And uh, they kept coming back. And eventually they said, well, what if we were to acquire you? And I said, well, we've got those other customers there. And they said, so then some more time passed. And then they said, well, we found this other consulting firm that could acquire your other customers. And then uh, we could acquire you and the group that's working on our stuff and you could move into our organization. And so uh, I was like, yeah, what are we going to do in your organization? And they were like, well, you're going to make us relevant in the 21st century. And I was like, well, it's, I was probably 
young enough to and dumb enough to say, oh yeah, sure, I can do that. <laughs> uh, and How old were you back then, maybe to ask? Let's see, 2001, I, I was, I uh, had just, I was either 29 or I had just turned 30. Wow, incredible. Uh, and uh, so, and they said, okay, we're going to give you $100 million and you've got to, uh, you can't invest it. You have to build stuff with it and you have to make us relevant. So you have to build things that are relevant to the financial world. Sounds like an easy mission. <laughs> you've got to return 15% on it. And I was like, okay. And then the second year they go, okay, so here's another 100 million. I'm like, whoa, whoa. You, you told me you're giving us 100 million. They're like, oh, yeah, well, that was for the first year. <laughs> uh, and at that point, I realized, I mean, I was not terribly smart, um, but I realized that they had set aside half a billion dollars. For you? For us, for, for our unit, yeah. To, uh, to build really uh, next generation stuff that we could think of in finance. And so the problem that I identified at the time was that the, the software infrastructure that we had as a bank was ancient. And mm -hmm. um, you know, this is, there were literally systems that had been running since the 1970s there. And that the, you know, I still believed in the internet and that the internet could become kind of that connectivity around the world in terms of moving money mm. around. Because money is data, really. At the end of the day, the same is true around uh, what's happening right now around SEOs and so on and so forth. So that really there's this realization that money is data we trust. Mm -hmm. And so we started rebuilding the back end of the bank as a set of APIs and a set of web services that could be combined in a number of different ways to move money uh, from one country to another. And HSBC is one of those companies that has this challenge of being able to move country from uh, money from one country to another really quickly. Right. At the time, they were in 82 different countries around mm -hmm. the world. And so having done that, you know, you'd say, well, an interesting engineering project, right? But how do you make money at it? Uh, but three years in, something magical happened because we had built enough of the APIs that we could start building new financial products very, very quickly. Just mm -hmm. like in today's world with uh, APIs being uh, available across everything, you can just combine them into new business models and take them to new levels. And but, so but, was it, but was it clear back then from like the, the board, the executive board that you had to make money with it? Or was it more like a long-term planning that they would say new technology? We had to, to figure out a way to return 15% on their investment, but mm. it was a very patient investment on their end in that they were looking at it in a five-year type of increment. Mm. And so uh, they were willing to wait until we figured this thing out. And so we started building like online only banks, uh, just BC Direct, which became uh, one of the big things that we rolled out around the globe. And then we built payment infrastructures because one of the things that people don't know is that whether you're uh, doing Google Pay, PayPal, Amazon Pay, et cetera, you, you're still eventually ending up on the bank network mm -hmm. um, because the money has to move from one bank to another or from one country to another. And so you have to uh, connect there. And because we had built it in a way that allowed for APIs to be connected, we ended up becoming the platform for a lot of those guys. And so we ended up building the backend for PayPal, for Google Pay, for Amazon Pay, um, and uh, Yahoo Pay at the time, which kind of died. Um, mm -hmm. um, and then we approached our competitors, uh, other banks, and, um, and told them, why don't we work on standardizing some of those interfaces together right. so that we can all talk in the same way, which uh, once they started getting on board with our ideas, led to really a complete revolution in the way you could build payment systems. And so that mm -hmm. led to second effect players like companies like Adyen, companies like uh, uh, Stripe, that were able to then take those interfaces and combine them in a way that uh, uh, 
uh, more consumer grade um, type of users were mm -hmm. able to leverage those types of infrastructure. Right. Interesting. I mean, that's an amazing, amazing story. And I mean, to see how actually HSBC back then was willing to to invest in the future technology. I mean, that I could imagine, and you probably know it better, that technology was probably something, of course, that was relevant and everybody understood that we you need technology in a company, but nobody could probably grab how much money you could make with it, right? There's there's always this push-pull, I think, in very large corporations around how to invest in technology. Right? The uh, technology is always going to change the way things are done. I mean, going back to... Uh, radio or uh, the telephone, right? And mm -hmm. technology always improves business. But when you're in a big company, you're like, okay, how do we make, is this too early? Are we investing too early? Or are we too late in the cycle? Or are we investing at the right time? And how much should we invest? Should, is this just going to be a fad? Because, you know, there's been technologies along the way that have crashed and burned and that have been really unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. uh, there's technologies that have come too early. So for example, one of the big trends that people are talking about right now is VR. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, I've tried VR headsets in 1992, 1991, 1985, you know, it's like, but they were built big, they were bulky, they were hard to use. You had to really have like a bunch of cables that were coming off your head and connecting into a whole bunch of computers that were only available in the lab. And so people that invested in VR at that time were right about where the future was going, but were wrong about their timing of investment. And mm -hmm. I think if you're in a big company, you always ask yourself, am I right in my timing there? Because if I'm going to invest as a big company, I'm not going to invest $100,000 in mm -hmm. order to for something to be successful, I'm going to deploy millions of dollars. And so you're either going to invest at the right time in the cycle, or you're going to over invest because you're late. And mm -hmm. I think what happened with HSBC was that at the time when I came on board, HSBC had the realization that they were late in the cycle, that their competitors had already started investing in, um, in uh, the internet mm -hmm. and they didn't have much of a position there. And so they overcorrected by investing heavily. And I was lucky enough to be able to come in at that time when um, they were making those investments and giving us the, the opportunity to, uh, to play with large amounts of money. And fortunately, uh, the people that I worked with also had a good sense of where the future was heading. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And there, I mean, there are so many dots that you back then needed to connect especially the vision of the podcast also is to somehow connect leadership with uh, product building and technology of course in if you look back at of course hsbc and also uh, if you look back at the time at deutsche bank where you also let the whole internet part in the company how like dealing with such big amounts of money and also building teams around the stuff that you should do as the cio of the company what did you learn leadership wise, but also from like a product perspective that you would give forward to to listeners that are also in a in a in a space where they want to build a team, where they want to start building a product? So uh, the first question that I generally ask from my teams is when you're looking at a problem, everybody tends to look at the future and go, okay, what's gonna change? And I have learned over the years that I think the important thing is, okay, what isn't going to change? Mm -hmm. what, what is it that is important enough that it's not going to change? Right? So if you are, if you are building today, let's say that you're building something uh, related to AI, right? mm -hmm. or, and you're looking at a particular problem segment and saying, we're going to apply AI to that. Mm -hmm. and so, if you apply AI to it, what is going to change is that you're going to have greater uh, computational power to crunch through a whole bunch of data, right? And so that's the change. Mm -hmm. But the question is, what doesn't change in the area where you're applying that computational data? So right. uh, 
there's a particular problem that is being solved somewhere and there's a lot of people in a room that are doing computation to solve that problem. That's an AI problem to solve because you can take all those people that were in that room and you can have an AI run through all that data and now they're solving the same problem but just doing it much faster. Mm. And you can do that across vertical after vertical. If you're looking at things like entertainment, right? well, so people like to be entertained. That's not going to change. <laughs> but that's important because if you're thinking about, well, what am I going to do in AR and VR in entertainment? Well, OK, so how have people been entertained over the years? Mm. You know, it used to be that they would tell each other stories. So stories are important if you're building an entertainment product. Right. It doesn't matter whether it's a product in AR or VR, it's a product on Alexa, it's a, pro it's a podcast product or whatever your story is still going to be important. Your narrative is still going to be important. That's never going to change. You know, you know, trying to build a social product, connection is one of those things that's kind of fundamental, human-to-human I mean, -human connection. That's not going to change. And so you take those core elements and you try to figure out how to adapt that to the problems that you're solving. Right. Interesting. I mean, I've, I've never heard that before to actually think about what is going to stay so what's not going to change i mean that's a good perspective because you can, you can always go in verticals and improve things and especially with ai and voice and the difficult technologies that are rising now you have chances to actually go into those verticals and make them even more efficient yeah so um great thanks for, for sh thanks for sharing i mean that's uh, that's something that that i've also also been very interested especially in the voice field um so what's what's your what's your approach now i mean you've now mentioned a couple of good good tricks here and there you're now building case book maybe you can give people a little insight here how that has risen over time and how you have come to the point where you need to still have the passion and the drive to do something else <laughs> well so I, I think really at the end of the day if you're an entrepreneur and you're a frustrated person mm -hmm. uh, if you're an entrepreneur you look at the world and you see a million problems that need to be fixed and you have the ego that believes that you're the one who's going to fix all those problems. <laughs> I think kind of the, really what drives you as an entrepreneur is that understanding that you know what I'm going to focus and I, every day I'm going to go and solve that particular problem. Right. And so uh, what's been interesting to me in terms of um, the space that I'm occupying is so, so casebook. Uh, since your listeners probably don't know about us, mm -hmm. is building a platform, a software platform, a SaaS platform, for an area called human services. Human services are the part of government where individuals are being helped, either by government providing them with some services, let's say for homeless people or for uh, foster care kids, or by giving them some money say, you know, food stamps and those kinds of things. And so uh, I was approached by this nonprofit um, called uh, Case Commons. And uh, they said, well, we've got this thing around child welfare here and we're uh, trying to figure out what to do with it. Mm -hmm. and I looked at the space and the human services arena was an area where uh, government agencies primarily had software that was built in the 1980s and 1990s by system integrators uh, who just built like customized software for every government agency one by one mm -hmm. and did so in individual silos. So if someone built something for child welfare, which is where um, you deal with uh, adopted kids or foster kids, they mm -hmm. just built solution for child welfare. If someone built a solution for homeless people, they just built a solution for homeless people. Mm -hmm. What happened if um, you know a child is part of a homeless family? That doesn't exist. No solution. And okay. So when you're starting to look at those components, you've got like a whole bunch of different portions of the problem, the poverty problem, that re rely for you to think of it as a system and mm -hmm. think of different dots that are connected. And then once you start thinking about it as a system, how do you connect all those dots? Well, in this world where agencies are providing software that is just line by line by line and system integrators who are people that are just building customized software for each of them are building software for each of those agencies, the problem is even wider. 
Mm. Because if you're dealing with a child welfare agency in one state and one in another state, the two of them have different systems. Right. And those systems don't talk to each other. And so you multiply that by all the areas where government is getting involved in terms of helping people, mm -hmm. and there's no interoperability. So what was interesting to me was that it's similar to what happened when I joined HSBC, mm -hmm. in that you had a whole bunch of different computer systems that were doing similar type of stuff, but not talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And so the, what we're trying to solve here at Casebook is we're trying to build that platform that will connect, that will become the connecting glue between all those different components by providing a way to uh, get someone to the right services and hopefully then layer in uh, some artificial intelligence on top of the data that we'll get out of uh, connecting all those agencies and identifying what are the best practices that you can apply. Because if you've got enough historical data, you can start saying, okay, there was this type of intervention mm -hmm. for this type of individual. And that, when I'm looking at the historical data across the whole population that we have, this type of intervention works. Now, this, this other type of intervention over here, mm -hmm. that only works about 20% of the time. So why don't we shift the money that's done on this other type of intervention to the one that works? And now we're going to start improving the overall outcomes for those individuals. Amazing. And real use cases are the ones that you just described. Uh, homeless people, um, families with uh, very yes. difficult problems or? Yeah. So the, the primary area where we've been focused is uh, child welfare, which is um, uh, the idea around what are called foster kids. So uh, kids that are taken out of their house, they're taken out of their house for a variety of reasons. Um, reasons ranging from abuse, and that's uh, drug usage, um, which is a big problem here in the United States, where if parents are mm -hmm. drug addicts, they have to take the kids out. Or poverty, um, because the parents cannot provide for their kids, provide food, provide a bed. Uh, mm -hmm. In those cases, the kid has to be taken out of their house and put in a foster family. The research has shown, though, that when you separate a kid from their family, it creates trauma, especially at a very early age. Right. And what it does, that kind of trauma takes the kids through the rest of his or her life and basically wrecks them for life. Mm -hmm. so what we're trying to do is that we're trying to identify what are the ways in which we can limit the amount of time that that kid is taken out of the house. You know, if it's something as simple as providing food or providing a mattress, mm -hmm. you know, there are government programs that allow you to do that. There are food stamps, but because those are not connected to the child welfare mm -hmm. systems, oftentimes the parents don't have access to those kinds of things. And so they can't get reunited with their kid because they don't have access to the right type of service. Amazing. Amazing. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, hats, hats off for such, such a social, a social project. project i think it's social, social project, project you're working on i mean you're you're helping very like people that are maybe in very difficult situations so i think it's great um was that also something that you have always wanted to do after like all the let's say capitalistic movements that you had with hsbc being a global bank deutsche bank also you co-founded you had different ipos and now you somehow giving back to people that are in problems is that something that you have always lived for I've always lived for um, using technology for good. And I think what happened was a lot of us built the technologies that served for increased communication on the internet. Mm -hmm. And with a lot of the people that I have uh, worked with over the years, we had this idea of eventually there would be um, politicians using the internet to, uh, to get their message out to mm -hmm. people. And that those position, politicians, because they're using the internet, would be enlightened politicians <laughs> who believed in the, the, making the right kind of decisions, informed by data, and so on and so forth. Uh, in, uh, in 2016, here in the US, it really didn't turn out the way we expected. <laughs> uh, and, um, 
And, and it was a really hard time, actually, after that election, because um, you know, Donald Trump had really used the tools of the internet, all the tools that we had created, right. uh, in the way we had expected them to be used. Mm -hmm. um, but he wasn't the kind of person we were expecting to emerge out of the use of those tools. Right. And so it's like it's November 2016, and I got really depressed, mm -hmm. to be honest about it, because I was like, did I spend the last 20 years of my life building tools that allow for this kind of outcome? Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, I mean, we've now we're not talking more about bot attacks and Russian involvement on social right. networks and, and, and all the negative stuff that social media has created. And so it was hard to think about my own role in terms of helping them. Mm. Because, you know, just, just as this podcast is hopefully going to help enlighten some people, Definitely. Um, you know, uh, because you're doing great work in terms of connecting innovators to your listeners in the same way there's probably a nazi podcast out there that's fueling more hatred fueling more anger mm. fueling more of a breakdown uh, in our overall approach right so those tools have a double edge um, to them mm. so all components tend to be used for both good and bad right and right as I was going to this kind of depressed state, I was approached by this nonprofit case comments. And, uh, uh, and I was like, oh my God, they've identified, they, they are in a space where the worst I can do is not do enough. Right. <laughs> 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 they, they approach you in the perfect situation, I guess. Yeah, they approach me at a time where I was particularly uh, sensitive to mm. what they were doing. Mm. And so I was like, this we have to solve. This is a problem we have to solve. And the worst I can do, hopefully, um, in solving this area is that I'm not solving it fast enough. Definitely. I mean, that's a project that we have also, I mean, we have the same problems in Europe. I, I, I just lived in South Africa for six months uh, last year. So I think uh, in Africa, it's a very, even more difficult problems in that regard. So I think you have lots of opportunities to help and give back to people that are in, 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 in definite, definite need. Uh, and I, I just love the idea of, of software and technology helping people to live life. Yeah, it's software for good. And the thing is that uh, I mean, it's a, a general trend about software kind of disappearing, right? If, he, if we are doing this properly, mm. software is going to become part of the fabric of everything that we're doing. And we're starting to see the edges of that happening where you know, people don't think about software anymore. And that's right. the way the world should be, right? Uh, I don't know how many of your listeners, for example, are going to pull you up on an Alexa or on a Google Home device mm -hmm. by just uh, saying the name of your podcast on this and say, you know, uh, play it now. But they don't think of the amount of technology that goes in terms of making that moment happen. Right. Or, you know, if you think about like getting an Uber or a Lyft, right, and press that button and a car shows up, mm -hmm. people don't think about the amount of work that it's happening behind the scene to get that car to where you are. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it should be. That's, that's the way technology should work. People right, should right. not have to think about the technology. People should have to think about the stuff that they're doing, the stuff where they need some help. And the technology should be there just to help them. Right. right. That's, that's, that's a, a lovely, 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 lovely round, round before we maybe have like a couple of more questions that are a little more informal and maybe also interesting to the followers because I always want to have something to leave with uh, in regards to resources. Uh, maybe book wise, I think you have met great people. We talked about Steve Jobs. We, have, we talked about Mark Andreessen and you've built very interesting products. You have met different teams around the world with building different different things. Are there like three books that you would recommend to the follower base or to the listeners? Uh, maybe also uh, prioritizing what's your number one, what's your number two, what's your number three in regards to any topic that have impacted your life? So um, 
I would say if you are in the financial space, mm -hmm. uh, you should read the Baroque Chronicles by Neil Stevenson. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fiction, I know. And, and I'm, by the way, I'm going to only recommend fiction books because business books come and go and business cycles come and go. But uh, fiction gives you kind of a view of the world that, uh, that may be slightly different. So the Baroque Chronicles, it's a set of three to nine books, depending on uh, whether you're reading the paperback or the, uh, uh, the hardback edition. And it's about money. Fundamentally, it's, I mean, yes, there's like uh, fighting and, uh, and all that kind of stuff, but it's about really money and ideas. Okay. So, uh, Steve Johnson is one of my favorite authors. Mm -hmm. He has a new book coming out. I'm blanking on the name right now, but basically you pull up anything by him. He's a genius. Okay. Um, so now uh, you will not get disappointed by any of the books that, uh, that he's writing. And I'm trying a third one. I've got to make it good. Now you, you put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell you before. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm reading actually uh, an interesting uh, series by uh, Malka Alder uh, and um, uh, Infomocracy is the, uh, the first title and uh, uh, the second one is called No State. And it's about what happens when, in the future, when we are post in a post-government world, where they create a world where any group of a hundred thousand people can form a government, and so every ten years you get an election. And so, I, I mean, you might have noticed I read a lot of science fiction, mm -hmm. and the reason I read a lot of science fiction is science fiction gives you clues as to where humanity could be headed. Mm -hmm. And then when you take that and you lay that on top of the world that you live in today, you can start identifying the areas where uh, there's potential areas for growth. Um, Interesting. I also read a tremendous amount of his history, not necessarily as relevant to uh, your readers, but I've been spending a lot of time uh, reading about the Royal British Society, which is mm -hmm. a group of scientists in the 1600s and 1700s, mm -hmm. uh, people like Sir Isaac Newton, and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. who really created the foundation for what we call modern science. Right. And so um, reading through you know, some of those historical components gives me a sense of what hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. And that so, comes back to what you just said before, right? Back to that, you know, trying to understand what are the fights that existed back then that still exist today, because those are giving us kind of a template as to what world we're always going to operate in. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Love it. I mean, that all of those three that you mentioned and also the, the last one, I will definitely put in the show notes for everybody interested. And uh, I think we have never actually had any of those three in the podcast so that's also cool to have a different different opinion here thanks for for sharing that um maybe let one last final question that also a lot of people are interested in is in regards to time management uh, because we have gone through different phases and you've had lots of stuff to do and different projects is there like a tool that you want to share or like a method that you have in regards to time management yeah so um i use a tool called trello T-R-E-L-L-O. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of your listeners may be familiar with it in terms of uh, using it as a, uh, a tool to manage their uh, development sprints. Mm -hmm. But I use it slightly differently uh, in that I've created um, a personal board on Trello. Mm -hmm. And my personal board has an inbox on one side. So anything that comes in, whether it's a meeting, whether it's an interview request like this, Mm -hmm. um, all gets into the inbox in terms of like, I have to deal with it at some point. And then uh, I've created separate columns for this month, this week, low priority, and this week, high priority. And today, low priority, and today, high priority. Mm -hmm. And then a waiting for column and a done column. And so okay. everything comes into the inbox. And at the beginning of the month, I move stuff from the inbox into stuff that's going to happen this month. Mm -hmm. And then at the beginning of the week, I move stuff 
uh, in either the high priority or low priority for the week uh, columns. Mm -hmm. And then every day I look at this week's stuff uh, in high priority and low priority and I move them along that way. And then whenever there's a response that's, uh, that's a wait, that where I've sent something and I'm waiting for a response, I move that into the waiting for column Got until it. I've gotten all the stuff and then done. And you also integrate it into your calendar, right? Um, I haven't fully integrated it into my calendar, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I live by Google Calendar in terms of uh, uh, where it all ends up. So that I do every day in terms of uh, looking at how my calendar is going to work. Right. Fantastic. Lovely. I mean, um, I could probably do like another episode about the future of technology since we talked about your stories. Um, lovely method also i will try it out i think it's very interesting um thanks again i mean uh, we covered so many different topics and i think if i could say it now i think this was like one of the top three interviews that i had so far because of like different views that you have in technology you get to find better interviewer interviewees then <laughs> <laughs> it's good to hear um i mean uh, you have been all around the world and uh being in different media industries so i think uh, would love to connect again um, really enjoy talking to you uh, thanks tristan and i'm sure there will be people very amazed about what you talked about yeah i'm glad i could help and you know if anyone has any questions they can reach me at tnl.net so um, just go onto my site use the contact form and uh, i may not answer immediately but uh, generally i try to get to uh, through my email sequentially and uh, eventually you will get an answer. Fantastic. Cool. We'll also put that in the show notes. And uh, thanks again for talking. Thank you. Have a great time.